reading from Hebrews, chapter 13, verses 1 through 8, 15 and 16. I will read first in my modern tongue. Que el amor fraternal permanezca en ustedes. Y no se olviden de practicar la hospitalidad, pues gracias a ella, algunos sin saberlo hospedaron a ellos. Acuérdense de los presos como si ustedes mismos estuvieran presos con ellos. Y también de los que son maltratados como si ustedes mismos fueran los que sufren. A todos ustedes deben honrar su matrimonio y ser fieles a sus cónyuges, pero a los libertinos y los adúlteros los buscará Dios. Vivan sin ambicionar el dinero, más bien confórmense con lo que ahora tienen, porque Dios ha dicho, no te desampararé ni te abandonaré. Así que podemos decir con toda confianza, el Señor es quien me ayuda, no temeré lo que pueda hacerme el hombre. Acuérdense de sus pastores, que les dieron a conocer la palabra de Dios. Piensen en los resultados de su conducta e imiten su fe. Jesucristo es el mismo ayer, hoy y por los siglos. Por lo tanto, Ofrezcamos siempre a Dios por medio de Jesús un sacrificio de alabanza, es decir, el fruto de labios que confiesen su nombre. No se olviden de hacer el bien y de ayudar mutuamente, porque estos son los sacrificios que agradan a Dios. Let mutual love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. For by doing that, some have entertained angels without knowing it. Remember those who are in prison, as though you were in prison with them. Those who are being tortured, as though you yourselves were being tortured. Let marriage be held in honor by all, and let the marriage bed be kept undefiled. For God will judge fornicators and adulterers. Keep your lives free of the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. So we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can anyone do to me? Remember your leaders, those who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Through him, then, let's continually offer a sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of lips that confess his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. This is the word of the Lord. Buenos días. Gracias y paz en nombre de nuestro Señor Jesucristo. Grace and peace in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is a blessing to be among you this morning in a place where so many beloved friends and students and employees and you know have uh, we have crossed paths throughout the years in the Presbyterian Church USA. Receive greetings in the name of the 223rd General Assembly which I will moderate with my sister, the Reverend Cindy Coleman. And we serve in this ministry of shared love for God and for this expression of the Presbyterian Church USA. Gracias to Reverend Ian Van Dyke for the invitation to be with you this morning. Thank you so much. I, I was sharing with her that Cindy uh, Coleman was here last year. We usually are not, you know, into places, but same place, but we are, there's a special love in my heart for theological institutions, and I was part of the Committee of Theological Education for a few years, and it was a pleasure to be here with President Van Dyke. Thank you. Um, I have a point of personal privilege, if I may, a word of gratitude to all of you, particularly to Reverend Jaime Meloni Rosario Gobbins and her husband, who received me on Sunday. Um, we came, I came ahead of the storm, I come from Miami, 
and you're with the Endoria bus rapid through the area, but I really wanted to make it to be with you. So I came a few days early, and this community has received me with such love. Uh, Reverend Dr. Catherine and Uso Gonzalez also received me, and uh, faculty, students, we had a conversation yesterday, and it, it has been a blessing to be here. Thank you once again. Please pray with me. Que las palabras que saldrán de mi boca sean agradables a ti, Señor. So picture this, it's around 7.15 in the morning or 7.20 in the morning, and I was sitting at my desk one of those rare days that I was not rushing and I was actually enjoying some quiet time, going over the lesson plans of the day, a to-do list that seemed to magically add a new item every time I glanced back at it. A country pop song played in the background and an aromatherapy old burner diffused a strawberry coconut essence in the classroom. A cup of coffee rested dangerously on the corner of the desk. Bliss. For about five minutes, when the bell rang and the students stormed into the classroom, book bags hanging loose from their shoulders, one minute swinging into their seats the next, a group of them laughing in a corner about something that had caught their attention two seconds ago, and some sleepwalking their way into a seat. Good morning, teach, one said. Your room always smells so good, teacher, said another. Hey, is that Taylor Swift? Miss Indron, have you finally read the last book of the Harry Potter series? Same question as yesterday, I might add. Wait, what? That test is today? Oh. Ah, yes. The sweet sounds of a high school classroom. And for almost two decades, my years began in August and not in January. Life was lived in semesters, sandwiched between the anticipation of the first day of school and the long-awaited high school graduation. Now that I've taken some time away from teaching, at least from teaching in a regular classroom, it is no wonder that when choosing the text for today's reflection, this particular passage from last Sunday's lectionary caught my attention. The 13th chapter of Hebrews, Hebrews, to this educator's mind, reads like the goodbye speech to students on the last day of school, or a list of top 10 things to remember as one moves to the next chapter of life. We are all familiar with the text. Some of you may have even taught a class or two on this letter, probably reading it directly from the Greek too. As we Puerto Ricans say, por que no es sobre mojado? translated, why pour water over a ground that is already wet. So my invitation this morning is to journey with me from another perspective, from an, uh, to look at this scriptural passage from an elder's, a laborer's point of view. As a summary to the context, those who heard Hebrews for the first time were going through the tensions and dangers of persecution some giving up on Christian faith altogether. This letter of encouragement, at times desperate and condemning, reflects the severity of the times and emphasizes on persevering on the faith. The ever popular chapters 11 and 12 go from defining what faith is, the assurance of things hoped for, the convictions of things not seen, to examples of those we consider champions of the faith, patriarchs and matriarchs through biblical history. Those who ran the race before them through promises unfulfilled, torture, mockery, flogging, imprisonment, and persecution. These leaders, part of that great cloud of witnesses, flawed human beings who loved and served the Lord. Now we're cheering them on as the community of Hebrews ran their own race with a different set of challenges and perils. By the time we reach chapter 13, the author is closing this sermon-type letter, encouraging the readers to stay firm, to practice certain behaviors, 
according to Dr. Paul Hooker, behaviors that bear witness to the presence of the kingdom of God in the community of faith. Surprisingly enough, these behaviors make a list of ten items. Continue to love each other. Show hospitality to strangers. Remember those imprisoned and tortured as if you yourself were the one being imprisoned or tortured. Honor and be faithful in marriage. Be free of the love of money. Be content with what you have. Remember your leaders, the ones who spoke the word of God. Consider the testimony of these, of these leaders and imitate their faith. Last number 10, continually offer a sacrifice of praise to God by not neglecting to do good and to share what you have. The plead is to continue to practice certain values such as love, hospitality, empathy, solidarity, loyalty, faithfulness, generosity, contentment, and trust. There is also an assurance. Though this is a difficult ask, they could be assured like in the past, God will be with them. So reading the list again and again and reflecting on the educational role most of us play every single day. Two verses kept coming up in my mind. Verses three, and verses 7, the verses that begin with, remember. Last Saturday morning, I spent some virtual time, me and my home, and I was home, and uh, the 2020 vision team of the Presbyterian Church USA was meeting in Louisville, and we were reflecting on this particular passage. This denominational team, to tell you a little bit of the Vision 2020 group, was tasked by the 222nd General Assembly to develop a guiding statement for this denomination as it moves forward into the future. And the team developed a guiding statement using the PCUSA acronym as an acrostic of sorts to portray the sections of the statement. God calls the Presbyterian Church to be prayerful, courageous, united, serving, and alive. And as we went around the virtual table, uh, reflecting on this passage of Hebrews, and how it spoke to the work of the team as it continues to share this guiding statement through the Presbyterian Church denomination, the Reverend Gerard Noreen, General Presbyter and Stated Clerk at the Presbyterian of Coastal Carolina, reflected on verse number three. Remember those who are in prison as though you were in prison with them. Remember those who are in prison as if you were with them. He was making emphasis and he was sharing with us that remember you yourself. Remember you are there. And it became a mantra in my mind. Remember as if you yourself. And it brought forth a comment that I read by Reverend Jill Duffield, where she states that each member of the body is not only a brother or a sister, but our own flesh. Our own flesh. So to remember in this verse is not merely a call to recall a memory. It is an invitation to remember someone to the point of actually feeling in our own flesh that person's, that sibling's pain. To remember in this sense is not passive, but active. It must move us desde nuestras entrañas into action. Much like the call of the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School students on the March, March of Our Lives to enact gun control change. Or to the call of Mission Presbytery and a group of Austin Theological Seminary students in the Wall of Welcome and Caravan of Hope activity last December to witness and stand with our refugee siblings in McAllen, Texas. Or similar to the call of the Baltimore Ceasefire 365 Initiative where local Presbyterians are 
are involved in inviting the, the city to celebrate life and to have no violence in ceasefire weekends. The call is to transform our passive remembering into concrete act. The second remember touches a particular fiber in our present setting as a place for leader formation. And it also involves action. It is a call to remember our leaders, to consider their lives, and to imitate their faith. How many times have we heard a misinterpretation of this verse as an instruction to follow religious leaders without question and to imitate their selfish or misguided versions of life and faith? And some people still question the importance of seminaries and serious theological education. This is not a call to remember, consider, and imitate any self-proclaimed leader, not even an appointed or an elected leader. No. The call is to remember the leaders who spoke the word of God and to imitate their faith after considering the outcome of their way of life. No pressure to those in leadership, right? This remember zooms into the core of who we are as disciples of Jesus Christ and bears to question, is the faith we profess the kingdom, or as the 238 said, the kingdom we proclaim embodies and is made evident in our lives. Is our life a worthy example to be considered and to be imitated? As we believe wholeheartedly in the priesthood of all believers, these existential and vocational questions pertain really to all of us. Church members, presbyters, seminary students, pastors, elders, faculty, deacons, administrators, co-moderators. When one considers the phrase, the outcome of their way of life, I cannot help and in this setting, particularly, to think about curriculum outcomes. Those measurable and observed skills and content that a student should have, should have mastered by the end of, say, a school year. These curriculum outcomes are important. Yet, for every expertly written, research-based curriculum, there is also a hidden the hidden curriculum. It's not the document we use as a guide for lessons and we submit to the accreditation agency. It is the curriculum that is not written, the one that is practiced, the implicit lessons we impart with the actions we take, how we treat other people, the guidelines to create budgets and where funds are allocated, the manner in which classes are taught, the services and programs we prioritize, the stories told through the design and location of our spaces. A word of caution on the hidden curriculum, my, my siblings. Though it's written, it speaks, it's not written, it speaks volumes. We might lose focus. So me, we must always be vigilant for the hidden curriculum. Always vigilant, because it will reveal the true soul of an educational institution. Almost two decades, journeying with my teenage students, listening to their hopes and dreams, sharing in their joys, their struggles, and their deepest fears, sometimes in the form of cop quizzes, changed me. It took me a while to understand. A student will remember more the classroom environment and the space created to foment life-affirming lessons that the literature, peace, 
which was the object of our class. When I realized this, teaching became mentoring, the classroom became a community, and the lessons became life experiences. Many mistakes were made along the way. There are a few traumatized adults out there, products of the errors and judgments that I made when I actually There were times my actions or words were not worthy of being imitated. And we all have had such moments. A conversation, a class, a comment, a moment we wish we could take back, do differently, or do over. Apologizing, recognizing, making amends, and learning from our mistakes, it's also part of the educational process. So as this new year begins, and you continue to fulfill this institution's mission of educating and nurturing faithful, imaginative, and effective leaders for the sake of the church and the world, do so with the assurance that God is your help and God is with you. May we see each other with grace-filled eyes. May we remember in our own flesh those who suffer. And may we all, as disciples of Christ, continue to offer our lives as a sacrifice of praise to God. And when the time comes for us to join that great cloud of witnesses may the outcome of our way of life be remembered, considered, and found worthy of being imitated for the sake of the church and for the benefit of the world. Así nos ayude Dios, so help us God. Amen.